So let me welcome you once again, and uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Robbie tonight. Robbie joined Microsoft in 1988, and over a period of 22 years worked in various marketing, general management, and business leadership roles there. I, we just heard that he had five different managers in your first four weeks. I guess it was a time of great transition at Microsoft. He spent two years as the company's first expat working at European headquarters in Paris. I, would that be why you're married to some a Dutch person? No, that's actually why we went to Paris, because I married a Dutch woman who wanted to live in Europe for a while. So. There you go. And then spent five years in various leadership roles <coughs> in the successful launch and expansion of the Microsoft Office business. Robbie then transitioned to the cons consumer side of the company, leading a number of businesses including leading the creation and development of the Xbox business. So that explains how much he knows about games. Microsoft served as Microsoft's, ro sorry, Robbie served as Microsoft's president of the entertainment and devices div division known as EDD from 2006 until his retirement in 2010. In that role, he successfully managed a worldwide end-to-end -end business with over 9,000 employees and turned these investment businesses into a division that generated $8 billion in revenue and $780 million in profit in 2010. In addition to his work at Microsoft, Robbie serves on the National Board of Governors of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and he just told me this evening that he has recently joined the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee. Uh, he's passionate about sports. Uh, which is yeah, one so of we can just skip the leadership thing if you want to talk basketball. I'll be happy to. <laughs> we can talk about March Madness and how all your pools got flooded. Robbie re received an MBA from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of North Carolina, where he was a first team academic All American on the Tar Heels tennis team. So uh, please join me in welcoming Robbie to Harvard Mudd College. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, if people don't mind, I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable without a podium, so I'll try to uh, uh, walk around. So hopefully that won't uh, disconcert anyone. Um, thank you very much, Maria, for the, for the warm welcome and for the wonderful dinner. And I had a great day today. Um, I had the pleasure of, of witnessing some student presentations today that were very, very interesting. Um, I got to guest lecture in a leadership class this afternoon, which was also a lot of fun and very engaging, and now have the opportunity to talk to you about leadership and management. So when I looked at the topic, I thought leadership. OK, well, I can, you know, we can talk about styles of leadership. There's interesting things to talk about. But then I saw the word management, and I said, oh, wait, that makes it a slightly different topic. Because leadership, to me, could be something you could do while managing. But I know a lot of leaders who don't manage anyone and who are actually involved in management. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about leadership and management. And I think that'll give things a little bit of a, of a different spin. I hope also um, that when I'm done, we can do some Q&A and have an opportunity for you to ask any questions you might have. And maybe then we can talk about the basketball. We'll get back to, uh, get back to that at some point. Second thing I'll note is that most of what I'm going to talk about tonight are things I learned about leadership based on what I would call challenges, what others would call failures. And I do think that so much of what I've learned over the 22 years at Microsoft and over the rest of my time um, has been learning through times of difficulty and learning from mistakes and learning from places where there were real challenges. I think one of the wonderful things about Microsoft for me over my 22 years is I made plenty of mistakes, but Microsoft was willing to live with that as long as I never made the same mistake twice. And I do think that's how you learn. And I do think that's how leaders become leaders. Because I, while there's certain natural tendencies that lead people to be good leaders or good managers, I think most things about leadership are acquired tastes and things you learn over time and skills that you learn over time. So for tonight, I, final thing is sort of introduction. I am a believer in what I call the rule of threes or fives. So whenever I talk or do anything, I have a list of three things I'm going to talk about or five things I'm going to talk about and nothing in between or certainly never more than five. Because if I talk about more than five, you won't remember any of it. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about three things around leadership. And the three topics 
I'm going to focus on are how important in leadership and management, how important teams are. That's topic number one. So ironically, I'm going to talk about leadership, but I'm going to start talking about the importance of teams. Second thing, which I think is also slightly ironic, is I'm going to talk about leadership and management and the importance of listening and how critical that is to being a, a great leader or a great manager. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is conviction. Because I think in the end, being a leader, being a manager, being someone who is uh, working with lots of people requires conviction. Now, I have to be honest, uh, those of you who are into acronyms, the acronym for those three things is TLC. That was not intentional, but when I was writing the speech, I said, oh, that's very convenient, so I'll use that um, as we go along the way. So let's start with topic number one as a leadership and management topic, which to me is about teams. And when I think about that, you know, usually you think of great leaders and you say, okay, Franklin Roosevelt, George Washington, pick, pick people who you think are leaders. And yet what you don't really think about is the team of people they had around them and where that team and how that leader interacted with that team to create greatness or to create something that was a powerful event. I will, as a, as a sort of a real demonstration of this, I'm going to go back to sports, since it is one of my favorite things, and go back to my college days playing tennis at North Carolina. And I always tell people that um, both at Carolina and at Stanford, most of what I learned, I learned some things in the classroom, but a lot of what I learned was through sports. And most of what I learned about teams and leadership, I learned playing tennis at North Carolina. Tennis is an individual sport. Growing up, I was never on a team, not once. So you're going all the way through high school. I played individual tennis. I was nationally ranked. I played you know, all over, but never really on a team. I played doubles, but that's sort of two individuals playing together. It's not really, it's not a team sport. When you go to a university, now suddenly you're on a team. And suddenly there's nine, ten guys who are playing. And you have to think about what it means to be a team. My junior year, we had three seniors who were really brilliant leaders. I don't know that they actually knew it at the time. But they were very good. And we had a very tight, close-knit team. And that team was way successful, above and beyond what we could have ever have hoped based on the talent we had. We finished second in the ACC, and if uh, myself and my partner hadn't choked in doubles, we would have finished first and we would have won the ACC that year. And that wasn't because we were the most talented team. We weren't even the, most, the second most talented team. But we were a great team. We traveled in a van together, this tiny little van. Nine guys in a van who have been sweating playing tennis is not a pretty picture. <laughs> We got along, and the team worked. And the reason it worked is because the leaders recognized, either unconsciously or consciously, what it took to get everybody to play together and what had to happen to make the team work. So that, to me, my junior year was fabulous. It was a great year. Now, go forward one year to my senior year. So there's three of us who are seniors, two of whom are uh, star players. I was the number three doubles player, so think of me as sort of a, a secondary player. Um, the two other seniors were elected co-captains, which made a lot of sense. And we had several new freshmen and a transfer join the team. And that team finished fifth in the ACC with more talent than the team had the year before. And the reason it finished fifth in the ACC is because the seniors on the team failed to figure out how to lead and failed to figure out what it took to create a team around them and underneath them. And it got to the point where we were traveling separately because nine guys who don't get along on a van is way worse than nine guys who smell and get along on a van. And it was very, it was very painful. I mean, I was happy when the season was over, which is sort of a sad statement when it's your senior year. It's the last time I played competitive tennis. And... When, as I reflected back on it, I said, you know what, I screwed up. You know, Josh and Ron, who are the other two seniors, weren't guys who were naturally going to think about leadership. I was a guy who did like 17 other leadership things on campus. And here I am, a senior on the team, a team that's dying for leadership, and I did nothing about it. And to me, it's a really powerful example of the interaction between a leader and the people around him or her that are making things actually happen. 
And in fact, in most cases, the success of most things are dictated by the team, not the leader. And yet the team is only great if the leader is there providing the right type of interaction, the right type of motivation, and the right type of activity to drive team leadership. So in a funny way, I walked away from that experience having learned a hugely important lesson. And as much as it was uncomfortable and painful and disappointing and frustrating, you know, the next year, the team won the ACC. Basically, same sets of players, a couple seniors gone, but the team had better leadership. The coaches did a better job. They, they own some of the problems we had. And the team won the ACC. And so you see the importance of composition, leadership, its interaction with team, and how that plays out. I fast forward uh, to Microsoft, uh, to the Xbox years at Microsoft. When we created the first version of Xbox, um, it wasn't a team effort. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, we had to do in 18 months what typically took three years. And we basically divided up the problem and said, hardware guys, go create some hardware. We got to do it at a console. Go figure that out. It's actually turned out in 18 months to be quite a hard problem. Uh, system software guys, guys who are doing the core software, the networking stack and all those things, go do what you have to do. Go figure it out. You might have to talk with the hardware guys to know what chips that they're using, but get it done. And then we said, okay, the secret to success in this space is having great games. So game guys, go do whatever you have to do. Go figure it out. And yeah, at some point you're going to have to find out what development software you're supposed to use for the system, but don't worry about that too much. Now, as it turned out, that worked okay and was expedient. Um, probably not the way I would do it if I had three years, but in the world in which we had 18 months and we were scavenging people from all over the company and from outside, I mean, this group was sort of the United Nations of development teams. It kind of, and I don't mean that from a nationality perspective. They just came from all different walks of life. We had some core networking engineers who were some of the geekiest people at Microsoft. We had some guys doing games who were some of the wackiest creative people at the company. And we had some hardware guys who were some of the most disciplined and structured guys in the company. And there just wasn't time to make that a team. So we were actually sort of explicit about it and just said, go get it done. So that more or less worked. It had its rough spots. It was terrible as a manager. I hated it. It was the hardest. I came within that close of leaving Microsoft in the middle of that project the first time. Because managing a team that's not a team is, was to me was really hard, but we got it done. Now go forward to the next version of Xbox, which is the current version called Xbox 360. And we decided that we weren't going to go through that pain again. And we decided that we were going to have an integrated team, which meant people had to work together. It meant the game guys had to sacrifice some things to make things easier for the system software guys. It meant the hardware guys had to do a better job with the system software guys on uh, anti-piracy and a whole number of other things. There was a whole set of sacrifices that each team had to make, but there was one integrated plan, an integrated management team, and the leader of the game team and the leader of the software team and the leader of the hardware team were expected to be Xbox leaders, not disciplined leaders themselves. In the process of that, I discovered that uh, one of the, the guy who ran the games business didn't think that was the right decision. And this is a guy who was a 20-plus year Microsoft veteran, fabulous guy. At one point, four members of his family worked at the company. His twin sister still worked at the company. He wrote significant portions of Excel, uh, literally the coding for the product. Um, he's the guy who bought uh, a product called Halo, which made Xbox successful, and, and a good friend. He and I had a discussion. He said, I think you're making the wrong decision. And I said, sorry, this is what we're going to do. He said, well, then I'm leaving. And the next day, he was gone. And he and I are still great friends. It, it, leaving was, in some ways, a great thing for him. He's done fabulous. And for the team, which is, this is my long way of getting back to my team uh, topic, for the team, it was the right answer, even though we lost an incredibly talented person. PR-wise, it was a mess. My boss was yelling at me, how could you let him leave? And I mean, it was, there was, it was all kinds of turbulence and turmoil. But a week later, the team was in a better space. We put somebody in the job who believed in the team, and it was addition by subtraction. And, and addition for him as well. You know, it, uh, 
uh, three weeks ago, he came to my Microsoft farewell party. And we had a great conversation. He's doing fabulous. It was all good. It was a painful decision at the time, but the importance as a leader to recognize the meaningfulness of having a great team was essential and became paramount above and beyond the individual considerations of the talent, which actually in Microsoft context, Maria could probably appreciate this, is actually kind of unusual because the company is sort of a place that believes in talent and you don't lose talent. And as much as I hated losing this individual, and he was very talented, it was the best, it was the right outcome. So for me, this whole area of team, and that's why I put it first, acronym notwithstanding, is critical uh, to what's going on and critical to how a leader works. And every team I've managed in the 22 years at Microsoft has been different. And every one of them has had to be managed differently. But I can't think of a case in which, with the exception of that first version of Xbox, where I didn't think having a great team was central to my leadership skill and management skill and my ability to be a good leader. So that's topic one, importance of team and, and how to think about that. Now, topic two is about listening. And typically, when you think about a leader, you think about somebody who can fire up the troops. You think about Patton. You think about guys who are who are speakers, who are brilliant orators, who are people who can inspire people. And right, leadership has an aspect of, of inspiration and speaking and being able to communicate for sure. But to me, ultimately, to be great at leaders, at leadership, you have to be a great listener. And you have to be able to hear what other people are saying. And the first thing you learn when you become a manager and a leader is what, you're, what people are saying to you is not what they mean. And the more senior you become, the lower the quality of information that comes to you. And the less, I don't want to say honest, but the less straightforward people are with you. And the more you have to read between the lines to understand exactly what people are trying to tell you. And leaders who take things at face value, in particular as you move up the chain in an organization, miss a hugely important point, which is the subtlety of what people are trying to say to you. Because when you become a leader, you are now somebody different to them. And they treat you differently. And they aren't as straightforward. There isn't a casual chat over a cup of coffee. There is never a casual chat with you as a leader. Because you're the leader. So people take every chat as serious. And they think about everything they say along the way in a very serious way. So for me, listening as a leader, and I'm not a great listener. Uh, this is my wife, would, if she was here, would raise her hand and give you a, an earful about that. I am not a fabulous listener, and it's something I've had, to, I've had to learn. And again, as I said earlier, most of the things you learn, you learn through mistakes. Um, and so I've had to learn that uh, through mistakes. And I'll give you two examples, one of which was clearly a big mistake, and another of which I probably navigated uh, more accidentally than not, but navigated more successfully. Again, to talk about Xbox, um, when we started Xbox the first time, Microsoft didn't know a whole heck of a lot about gaming. Um, we had a couple of PC games. Uh, any flight simulator enthusiasts in the crowd? Right. Well, what flight simulator was classified as a game, but it's not really a game. There was nothing, it wasn't really a game. It was just simulated flight, and more in my case, simulated crashing, which I was very, <laughs> su very successful at. So we had a very small gaming background. We had a couple people who knew the gaming industry, but not much knowledge. We also, when it came to doing hardware, you know, the most complicated piece of hardware we've done was a mouse. It actually turns out to be more complicated than you might think, but nevertheless, I mean, we never produced a computer. We never produced anything close to as complicated as a video game console. And so we went into this space with a lot of smart people, a lot of motivated people, a lot of talented people and not a lot of people who knew anything about how the gaming industry worked. And to be successful, we had to listen. And, you know, for a bunch of type A male game guys, that's really hard. It was very challenging. But we had to go out into the marketplace, talk to our partners, listen, and learn. And at the same time, look confident like we knew what we were doing. It was actually a very tricky, uh, tricky balancing act. So one of the things we did 
is we decided that we were going to go visit every game publisher twice a year. Um, so the way the gaming business works, we produce Xbox, and then companies like Electronic Arts and Activision and THQ and um, um, well, a bunch of Japanese companies, Konami, uh, Take-Two Interactives, another U.S. company, would produce games. And they would pay us a royalty when they sold them on Xbox. So we decided we would go out twice a year to visit each of these game companies. Now, it turns out that was something completely new for them. Rarely had they had, Nintendo had never come to visit them. Um, and Sony had only very rarely come to visit them. They would see them at trade shows. They'd go to Sony. They'd go to Nintendo to talk to them. But it was them having to go talk to the mountain, so to speak, rather than the mountain coming to them. And so we would have these three-and-a-half-hour sessions twice a year where we would go to their facility, and it was always at their site, and we'd tell them what we were thinking about and ask them for feedback before we announced anything publicly or did anything publicly. And the most important part of that wasn't us communicating what we were planning to do. Uh, that was necessary, but we could have done that in an email, a phone call. There's lots of ways to do that. But the most important part was being able, for me as a leader, and I went on all these. As a guy who ran the business, I did, did all these tours. I skipped a couple in Japan, but I did almost all of these. And the most important part was me listening to the feedback they had and learning from it. And I literally think those publishers helped us be successful more than anything else. And they taught us how to be good in the video game space. Sometimes knowledgeably. Some, some of them knew they were doing it. Some of them didn't. But I learned a huge amount from them. And you'd walk away after two or three of these tours. I could tell you which guys in the game business were going to be successful and which guys weren't because you'd discover who was smart and who wasn't. And the guys who were honest and gave you really tough, hard feedback, the tough meetings were the best. And the meetings where it kind of went easy and everybody said, oh, that was a good meeting, were bad meetings because they didn't learn anything. And so over time, now two or three, four years in, now the nature of the meeting started to change. We continued to do them, but we had enough credibility that they actually wanted to learn from us too. And so now the meetings became much more of an even exchange. And what it did is we developed respect with them as a leader in the gaming industry. And, and they respected the fact that we always came to their place. We always had the conversation. These conversations were always in the same room. You sat in the same chairs. I mean, it became very comfortable for everybody and really had a huge impact on our ability to be successful. And so I walk away from that as a leader. So people would say, gosh, Robbie, that was, that was brilliant leadership on your part to get the team up to speed and blah, blah, blah. And I would say, no, this was all completely accidental. It was mostly I just felt like we should go pay homage to these guys because we wanted their business. It was mostly a sales technique more than anything else. But in the process, we listened. And from that came leadership. And I think sometimes people get confused about leadership being about the process of communication and making decisions. And there's certainly an aspect to it of that. But to me, it's also a prospect of listening and learning and then reflecting that back and incorporating that into the things you're doing. So that's the good example of listening. Let me give you the bad example of listening. And Maria will appreciate this one perhaps more than she probably should. Um, so we were doing a project um, in our mobile business. And our mobile business um, was, was going through a lot of, uh, of challenges. This would have been about 18 months ago. It's going through some very difficult challenges. Phone. phone, sorry, our phone business. Um, it was called Windows Mobile at the time. It's now called Windows Phone. And uh, there was a project called, uh, internally codenamed Pink, which eventually became a product called Kin. And the only reason I could talk about this is because it's now all public. The product was amazingly unsuccessful. Um, was the least successful thing I ever did at Microsoft by a factor of about four. And it is a classic case of not listening well. So let me, let me describe that to you. This is a project that started off with a small group of people who produced a really good concept. Best concept presentation I saw in the 22 years I was at Microsoft. Had me convinced that this was something we should do. And invested. And significantly, this is hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. And we got started on the project. And as things went along, there was a set of technology they were counting on to make the project successful that got delayed. And that changed their plan. 
And then their project got delayed. And now the thing that would have been great in 2009 was maybe going to be okay in 2010, maybe, but probably was not go was going to end up being mediocre. And so my management philosophy on this was, A, try to understand myself how I thought it was going to work, and B, talk to the team. Where do you think it is? And talk to our partners. Where do you think it is? You know, Verizon was going to be our exclusive distribution partner, so I spent a lot of time with Verizon. I'm very... You know, learning my lessons from the game industry, I'm going to go talk to them. Well, the problem was I didn't listen carefully enough. Look, the team, the senior leaders on the team knew it was in trouble. And, but they knew how much money we'd put into it. So they didn't want to be the guys that said, you should, you should not ship this product, you should shut it down. And I talked to them afterwards, after we did shut it down, shipped it, and then didn't like it and shut it down, which was way more painful. And they said, yeah, I, pro I knew that probably six months ago, and I just couldn't figure out the right way to communicate it. Yeah, that's making Maria cringe. Uh, she, uh, it's painful, but, but absolutely true. I talked to the guys at Verizon, and they said, yeah, we knew in February it probably wasn't going to be successful, but we were so committed to our Microsoft partnership that we didn't want to tell you. So, and then the third thing that I would say from a listing perspective is right here. And the most important listening organism you have is in your own gut. And I knew in my own gut that this was a high wire risk that probably wasn't going to pay off. And I couldn't get myself over the commitment, how much I loved the team, and how much I loved the original concept, and the fact that the world had changed and passed the concept by. And so it is a hugely important lesson in the subtlety of listening and the subtlety of what I would call precision questioning to actually enable people to tell you what they want to tell you and enable people to get out the real information. And this is super hard. And like I said, you know, it's a, it's a tough technique. You've got to be very skilled at it. Um, you know, and, and I didn't do a good job doing that. I learned from it, but I didn't do a good job uh, uh, in doing that. And so when I think about great leadership, I think, okay, T, team, got to have that. But you got to be able to listen. Partners, employees, yourself, your own gut. And be uh, thoughtful and precise and disciplined about making sure you get the information you need and the things you get, uh, get out right. And really make sure you know exactly what people are trying to communicate to you because it's, it's very difficult if you don't let that happen. So that's the second, uh, you know, learnings from failure and learning from, from uh, in some cases, from some success. The third area I want to talk about leadership is the C, which is about conviction. And I think leadership and management in many respects um, at key influential moments comes down to conviction. And if you're going to be a great leader, there will become moments of truth where you have to make the hard decision. It doesn't actually happen that often. Where you have to make a hard decision and you have to be convicted and make the right decision. And you can't um, be wishy-washy about it. You can't sugarcoat it. You have to decide what needs to be done. Be convicted about it. Have other people on the team see you're convicted about it and make it happen. So I'll give you two very good examples of this. Um, the first goes back a long time in history, so I apologize for those of you who, uh, the students probably won't even remember this time. How many people in the room remember 1, 2, 3, and WordPerfect? Anybody remember those products? Yeah, see, it's all the, all the mostly people in my generation, none of the younger generation. In the early 90s, 1, 2, 3, and WordPerfect owned the word processing and spreadsheet market. Owned it. 90% market share in word processing for WordPerfect, 90 plus percent market share in spreadsheets for 1, 2, 3. And Microsoft had these products called Microsoft Word, which on the PC was a, a very distant also ran um, uh, to WordPerfect, and Excel, which on the PC didn't exist yet, hadn't been shipped yet, it was just getting ready to come to market. And I came back from Europe and was put in charge of Excel marketing. And there's a friend of mine still at Microsoft, still a good friend, Mark Cruz, who was put in charge of marketing for Microsoft Word. And these teams didn't like each other. The development teams did not talk to each other. So the Word team and the Excel team competed with each other. 
and the Word team would get a good review, and they'd go flaunt it over the Excel team. They argued at one point for about six months over the number of pixels in the height of a toolbar. <laughs> and the Word team thought their pixel height was better than the Excel team's pixel height. I mean, so you get the idea. So it's a very tough, challenging environment. And yet we concluded after about a year, as we're going into 1993, 1994, that the only way we're going to unseat WordPerfect and 123 is to sell Word and Excel and a product that nobody knew about called PowerPoint together in a product which we subsequently called Microsoft Office. And the reason for that being successful, there's a number of reasons why that was important. Um, corporations were starting to standardize and they didn't want to standardize and buy from five different vendors, they wanted to buy from one vendor. There was price discounts that you could apply to an office sale that you couldn't do for Word and Excel. Um, the technology was making it easy to share information between the applications and WordPerfect and 123 didn't talk to each other very well, so that was a competitive opportunity. And we knew that WordPerfect and Lotus had tried to merge and failed because the two CEOs didn't like each other, and so we knew that wasn't going to happen. So there was real logic behind bringing these two things together. And yet I will tell you, and I wasn't a leader of Office, I was a leader of Excel marketing, and Mark was a leader of Word marketing. He and I were good friends, but we just looked at it and said, wow, this is going to be really hard because these two teams don't get along. We don't work together. So we had this somewhat famous conference call with our, he wasn't our, my boss at the time, he became my boss later, with Steve Ballmer. And I told Maria this story earlier. He was, he was working in Europe at the time. He took a six-month uh, leave to work in Europe for Microsoft, running our worldwide sales force from Europe. So we were presenting the plans to him for office which were at best half-baked and unlikely to be successful as currently formulated in hindsight. It was a bad plan, um, in part because we didn't think about it carefully enough, in part because the product teams couldn't talk to each other. So it was, it was just a bad plan. So we're on a video conference. So this is video conference sort of Cro-Magnon style. So you've got to remember, this is when the audio came first and the video came later. And if any of you know Steve, he's a very animated guy. And so he's sitting in this video conference, smiling at us, just smiling, listening, and you see his face, just doing this. And then the audio comes in first, and he's yelling at us. I mean, just yelling at us. And we deserved it, to be fair. This is not a complaint. We, we absolutely deserved it. And then about 30 seconds later, in the video, he jumps up and gets all animated and starts yelling us, at us in the video. And Mark and I realized after that that the time had come for a change and that we had to have the conviction of what we knew was right and go have a talk with the guy who ran the desktop application division and say, this is crazy, We're not, marketing's not going to fix this problem, we have to make some changes. And other people had that conviction as well, so it wasn't just us. And after that, we restructured marketing. So we restructured development about uh, six, nine months later after the products were finished. But we made, created one office marketing team and we said, your job is to make Office successful. And if that means Word by itself is less successful, so be it. If Excel is by itself less successful, so be it. And if your development team don't like it, send them to me. And it was, you know, a liberating moment. And the company got convicted. Steve was convicted. The sales force got convicted. Ultimately, the development teams came along because they realized that it was working. And, um, you know, it was a moment of truth for the company. And I take little credit for the conviction because I had to get yelled at to have it. And anytime you have to get screamed at to have the conviction, that means you didn't have it natively. So that's not a good thing. But that moment in time was amazing. By 1997, Word and Excel had 90% of the word processing and spreadsheet now. So it's a three-and-a-half-year transition. And... You know, to me, the power of that conviction is so important. And, you know, to Steve's you know, uh, um, credit, and I think he's in many ways, he has, he has a very unique leadership style, but he is a great leader in many ways. And his, you know, literally yelling at us and saying, hey, you got to get this done, was a point of conviction. He just said, look, there's no opportunity. If you guys don't want to do it, I'll get somebody else. And it was the right thing to do at the right time. So that's my conviction story number one. That's a, uh, I'll call that a success, but would have been a failure if I had not been uh, yelled at over a video conference from, uh, uh, from Paris. 
Uh, the second story about conviction that I'll say um, relates to Xbox again. Um, another painful period, but I think powerful. We had with Xbox 360, uh, which has proven to be a great product. Um, it's proven to sell incredibly well. I don't know, we're at 60 million units sold or something like that these days. Um, has done very well. But in its first, after about 12 months, we discovered we had a really bad technical problem with the product. It's a thing that the students in the room will recognize as the three rings of death. How many three rings of death uh, people do we have in the room? Come on, Singer, you had to have three rings of death. You must have. You, could, you don't have to. So this basically um, rendered the hardware, basically shut it off and it wouldn't work again. It was a very deep, hard technical problem. Something we didn't find in testing. To this day, I don't know if we could have found it in testing. It's one of those uh, system interaction problems that if you don't do things in exactly the same way twice, you never find the problem. I'm not sure we would have ever found it. But this was a billion dollar problem, literally. Um, we were taking customer complaints, people returning Xboxes, retailers were yelling at us. And the team, frankly, was a little bit paralyzed about what to do. Because on the one hand, the engineering team wasn't 100% sure they knew how to fix it just yet. And they were still working really hard just to understand the problem. It was that tough of a problem. And the business team, the product was still selling really well. I mean, customer satisfaction through this entire period, customer satisfaction, it was the highest customer satisfaction product I've ever worked on, <laughs> right? And took the largest uh, effectively return in Microsoft history. Um, so people loved the product. They just hated that it stopped working sort of a problem. So I, 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 I reached the point where I said, okay, this is my job, not anybody else's job. And I called a meeting at my house. So we met in the basement of my house on a uh, Thursday night. I don't know why we met at my house. I think it was the only place everybody could get to. And it was probably, I had some event that night and I got back. So I literally had the senior engineering guy there, the head of PR, the head of marketing, um, myself and the guy who was running the Xbox team at that time, a guy named Peter Moore, came over to my house. I sat down and said, okay, what do you know? And we went through the things we know. And we left that meeting and we agreed that we were going to announce a three-year warranty for anybody who bought an Xbox in the first year with free repairs or free replacement. Now, that may sound like, well, that's a logical thing to do, treat your customers right. It's also the first billion-dollar write-off Microsoft's ever taken. Um, and so uh, our CFO, myself, and the head of engineering got to go to present to the board. This might have been before you were on the board, Maria. Um, got to go present to the board and explain to them why we were going to write off a billion dollars and why a billion dollars was the right number. Which was, and, and honestly, it, it, since we couldn't 100% characterize the problem, it was a little tough to know that a billion dollars was actually the right number. But we got through that process, and then you have to go announce this to Wall Street and the press and all those kinds of things. For me, this, you know, some of the most horrible days of my time working in the division. Um, and some of the hardest personally from an emotional perspective. Because I'm a, a guy who has a lot of pride in what I do. I have a ton of pride in Xbox and what it represented and, and how well it was actually doing in the market and the work that the team had done. And yet, there was certainly a feeling amongst the team that there was failure. And so, this is where conviction comes in. And as a leader and a manager, you have to tell people, this is where we are. This is what we have to do. Move on. Do it right. Deal with the customer issues. Treat them the right way. Take your medicine. Continue to build the business. And I've had people, you know, when, when you decide to retire, people come up and say, oh, I remember this. Every one of the people who came to that meeting at my house remembered that meeting. And every one of them came up and said, that's when I knew we were actually going to be successful and we were going to fix the problem. Which to me was, again, an aha moment. Obvious in many ways, but an aha moment. Because what they needed to see was somebody who was going to take responsibility for the problem and start the process of healing and not try to hide behind the problem. And the guy who ran engineering, hardware engineering, who you would say was you know, ultimately responsible for that, that guy is an amazing guy. He's still there, still runs hardware. Um, I would hire him, if I was starting a hardware project, I'd hire him tomorrow in a split nanosecond. And he worked his butt off for two years and fixed it. We had to build a whole new repair and refurbishment manufacturing process, a second supply chain for all the repair and refurbishment, and we're taking back millions of boxes. 
and reshipping them and repairing them and replacing them. I mean, it was a second business. And he took that on and dealt with it and was convicted about it. Could have left the company easily. It would have been, you know, financially, he could have left the company. He'd been there a long time. But he wasn't going to do that. And so to me, this topic of conviction is super important from a leadership perspective. And I take those three things together, and maybe they aren't the traditional things you think about when you think about leadership. Um, but to me, they are core values that, to me, leadership is about team. It is about listening. And it is about, at key moments, figuring out when you have to have hardcore conviction about something and just make it happen and get people to follow. And um, like I say, I think I've probably missed more than I've made on that if I, if I judge against that scorecard. But I certainly feel like I learned the scorecard uh, pretty well along the way. And I feel like it's something that hopefully in my, my next act, whatever I decide to do in the future, will, will serve me well. I want to wrap up by talking about one other aspect of leadership, which I think will feel like a non sequitur, but was very important to me personally which is I want to talk to people about leadership in life. And in some ways, this is more directed at the, at the students than, than the, the faculty, perhaps. Maybe everybody can take a little something from this. Um, when you do something for 22 years, and then you decide to step back and figure out what you're going to do next, you reflect a bit. And you reflect a bit on what you think is important. And I take leadership seriously. And I think about leadership as a life thing as a life skill, not as a business or professional skill. So I have sort of three things to say about leadership uh, in life. Uh, the first thing is take the time to find balance in your life. Um, one of the things I noticed from all the students I met today, and this is, um, I suspect, at a higher level at Harvey Mudd than at most schools, but I see this in a lot of students today, is passion really passionate about what they're doing, and really excited about what they're doing. And the challenge you'll discover as you get older and further in your career is that that passion, um, while super important and something you have to pursue and feed, has to be balanced with other things you need to lead a completely fulfilling life. And that's hard to see today, A, because your day is four hours longer than the rest of our days today. As you get older, you'll need more sleep, I, I suspect. So you have more time to pursue more passions. But you get married. You have kids. You have other obligations. You decide you want to give back to the community. Suddenly, there are more things pulling at you, and yet you still have this core passion. Figuring out how to balance that passion is a leadership activity for you. And, and the sooner you figure it out, the better. I figured it out probably late in my career. Um, but I'll, I'll just share the quickly the story of how I figured it out. This was at the time when I was thinking about leaving Microsoft with Xbox. This would have been 2002. And I was talking to a, a guy who was giving me career advice and, and personal advice. And he's, I said to him, I said, you know, I'd leave Microsoft, except I'd feel guilty about leaving in the middle of the project. And he said, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. That's not your problem. That's your boss's problem. Your problem is to figure out what you want to do how you want to balance your life, and then go do it. And if that means you have to leave Microsoft, so be it. Leave. But if you, if you still have passion for Microsoft, it's not your boss's problem that your life is imbalanced. That's your problem. So go fix that. And one of the suggestions he made, which uh, you know, I, I still do to this day, is I plan my travel nine months in advance if I can. And so I literally, when I decided to stay, I went back and I told my assistant, I will do no travel unless requested by somebody from the team nine months in advance. And the team, people sort of went, whoa. And then slowly they said, well, OK, let me think. Nine months out, yeah, there's that conference. Yeah, we're going to want Robbie there. OK, let's put in a request. People got in the rhythm of it. And they suddenly started being very thoughtful about when I travel. And what I discovered was I traveled less, I got more done, and my family and I could plan when I travel. And my life got more balanced, you know, really overnight. And the other thing I discovered is that this team suddenly realized, well, gosh, maybe I don't need to travel as much. You know, that extra trip, maybe I don't need to take that trip. I'll just do it as a phone call. That would probably work. And I should be more thoughtful about when I travel. And it had this, you know, and again, not an, not an idea I came up with, 
But it had this very interesting effect on the team. Now, when you're president of the division, you can make statements like that, and people have to pay attention. So I had a slight advantage of position um, to be able to enforce it. And every once in a while, there were trips you have to take that you can't plan nine months in advance. Sometimes events overtake things. But I will tell you that taking control of my life enabled me to pursue my passion for another 10 years. And that, to me, is a, was a super important lesson. Second thing I'll say about leadership in life, um, have faith. And this is not a, this is not a religious statement, but you've got to have faith in something. That can be religion. That's fine. It can be something else. It can be faith in yourself. It can be faith in your passion. It can be faith in your team. But it sort of relates to the conviction point. You've got to understand what's at your core principles and core values and have faith in doing that. And, you know, for some people, that does have a religious overtone. For other people, it's about community involvement. For other people, it's about, well, I'm going to be committed to this certain set of things. But um, having, having faith and really knowing you have touchstones that you can go back to, I think is remarkably important and deeply personal. It's something only you can really wrestle with. Um, I used to, people used to ask me, say, well, you know, what's the advice you give somebody coming to Microsoft? And I'd say, well, the thing I always have faith in is that if you do the right thing, the right thing will happen. And that sounds sort of stupid. Don't do things because you think it's expedient or because you think it's going to help develop your career or because you think it's something somebody else wants you to do. Do the right thing because you know in your heart and your gut it's the right thing. And if that's hard for you, if doing that is recommending a, your division to be disbanded, so be it. The right thing will happen. You'll have a new job. People will respect you for having the right opinion. And life will move forward. So figuring out the things you're going to have a core value about and core faith about I think is important. And then the final thing I'll say, um, serendipity is a huge and powerful force. Um, somebody asked me today, well, did you have a long-term career plan when you joined Microsoft? And I said, well, my career plan was join Microsoft, and within two or three years, I wanted to work overseas. And that was about as far as my career plan went. And in my 22 years, I never asked or thought about what my next job was going to be. And, uh, and the jobs that came available and that I ended up in, I would have never guessed. You know, small secret, I don't play video games. Never have. Didn't grow up playing them. Um, I love it. It's competition. I think it's an amazing industry. It's incredibly cool. Never played them. If you'd asked me when I graduated from Stanford Business School, oh, 15 years from now, you'll be running a video game company, I would have laughed my ass off. There was no way I would have figured that out. And yet, because a guy who was going to run the business decided to leave the company and go to a startup, and I was the only one left standing, I got the job. And that serendipity changed my career and gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to learn for another 10 years at the company about not just the video game industry, but a whole bunch of other things that have really changed the way I think about my career and changed the way I think about my life. So my message on life leadership is, oh, you should have a plan. That's all fine. But be open to serendipity. Use that power. Because when the opportunity knocks, you got to be ready to recognize it. you got to be ready to see it and uh, take advantage of it. And if it sounds crazy, maybe that's more reason to think about it and think about it a second time. Um, it may not be something you ever expected, and then you may look down the path and say, wow, that was the, one of the best things I've ever done. Um, so with that, I'm going to pause. If you have questions, things you'd like to, to ask me, I'd, I'd entertain some questions.